Hi friends, welcome to this new video on the Dr. USP channel. In this video, we'll be discussing scale development. So how do you measure something you can't see like uh, confidence or stress for example? That's where scale development comes in. In this video, we'll walk you through how researchers turn ideas into reliable, measurable tools so your data actually means something. Let us see master scale development from theory to validation in this video. And we'll be discussing uh, these points, defining the construct, then we go to item pool generation, then refining those items, pre-testing, sampling, followed by exploratory factor analysis. Then we go to confirmatory factor analysis. We talk about reliability, validity, and finally norming and standardization. So in research, a scale is not just a collection of questions. It's a carefully built instrument a bridge between invisible ideas and measurable responses. When we want to measure something abstract like self-esteem, anxiety or job satisfaction, we cannot simply observe it. We need a structured tool that invites people to reveal bit by bit what lies beneath the surface. A scale does exactly that. It uses multiple items often rated on standard options like strongly agree to strongly disagree to capture the presence and intensity of a hidden construct. A well-designed scale transforms a vague concept into concrete, researchable data, opening a window into the human mind one question at a time. These are some of the well-known scales. The Rosenberg Self-Esteem Scale has 10 crisp items. It has become a gold standard for measuring self-worth. The Beck Depression Inventory with 21 uh, statements helps clinicians gauge the depth of depression. The Big 5 Inventory elegantly captures our 5 major personality traits across 44 carefully worded statements. The first and most crucial step in scale development is to refine the theoretical construct with precision. A construct represents an idea or phenomenon that cannot be directly observed such as academic motivation, job satisfaction or emotional resilience. To define it, the researcher must scan existing literature, identify the essential attributes of the concept and draw clear boundaries around what the construct includes and what it excludes. So the item generation begins with review of existing literature. We then identify the core attributes, we set conceptual boundaries, clarifying what is included and what is excluded from the construct's domain. We then write an operational definition and we frame the construct in specific measurable terms suitable for item creation. And then we align it with the research purpose. So a key starting point in scale development is to examine existing instruments and adapt proven items. Since there are limited ways to ask about a given construct, adapting earlier items is often practical. New items can be generated from multiple sources. The target population through focus groups, theoretical frameworks, existing research and expert opinion. The initial pool of items is much larger than the final set to allow for careful selection and refinement. Researchers aim to generate a pool that is three to four times larger than the expected number of final items. Writing more quality items than ultimately needed enables the selection of those that best capture the essence of the target construct and that align cohesively with other items. After generating the initial pool of items, refining them is crucial to ensure each item accurately captures the intended construct. The process begins with a content adequacy check, examining whether each item stays true to the concept or strays into irrelevant areas. Focus groups and in-depth interviews with knowledgeable individuals provide rich qualitative feedback. Focus groups allow open discussions on item relevance while interviews dive deeper into logical fit. Next, a systematic evaluation by expert panels is conducted. Experts rate items by their representativeness, 
from very representative to not at all representative, quickly filtering out weak items. Finally, every item is compared directly against the theoretical definition of the construct. The first step in evaluating test items using the classical test theory is to examine item difficulty. It is a proportion of examinees who answer the item correctly, ranging from 0 to 1. Higher values indicate easier items, while lower values point to more difficult ones. It is followed by item discrimination. This involves carefully calculating the biserial correlations between an item and the total construct score. Beyond the CTT, item response theory offers a more detailed and sample independent way of evaluating scale items. IRT offers a more sophisticated approach by modeling the probability of a correct response based on both item characteristics and the respondent's ability level. IRT provides detailed item level information. Researchers also evaluate inter-item and item total correlations to ensure that items are consistently related to each other and to the overall scale score. High inter-item correlations suggest coherence while item total correlations show how well each item fits within the scale structure. Distractor efficiency analysis is done to check whether they meaningfully attract responses from lower ability individuals without confusing higher ability respondents. Pre-testing is a crucial step to assess whether the drafted items accurately reflect the intended domain. Researchers administer the draft questions to a small group, 5 to 15, across 2 to 3 iterative rounds. Respondents are encouraged to verbalize their thought processes as they interpret and answer each item. This technique reveals hidden ambiguities, misunderstandings or unintended interpretations. Once the refined items are ready, researchers must select a sample that accurately represents the population. Sampling decisions directly affect the scale's credibility. The sample should be large enough to allow for analysis such as exploratory factor analysis and confirmatory factor analysis, with common recommendations suggesting a minimum of 5 to 10 participants per item. One should aim for a minimum total sample of around 300 participants. A scale's dimensionality refers to the number and nature of the underlying variables or latent constructs that the items are designed to measure. When a scale captures only one construct, such as self-esteem, it is considered unidimensional. If the scale measures multiple constructs like different aspects of personality, it is multidimensional. The process begins by verifying whether the data is suitable for factor analysis. Researchers typically conduct Bartlett's test of sphericity and they look for a significance value less than or equal to 0.05 and calculate the kaiser mayer olkin measure of sampling adequacy seeking a value of more than 0.6. The correlation matrix should also be inspected to ensure that most correlations are at least 0.3 or higher. Once factorability is established, an exploratory factor analysis is conducted using an appropriate extraction method, such as principal factors analysis or maximum likelihood. Determining the number of factors is guided by theoretical expectations, the scree test, parallel analysis and the MAP procedure. After extraction, factors are rotated preferably using oblique rotation methods like direct oblimin or Promax which allows factors to correlate. Reliability ensures that a scale produces consistent and stable responses over repeated administration. One of the most common methods to assess internal consistency is by calculating Kronbach's alpha, which measures how closely related the set of items are to one another relative to their total score. Other reliability coefficients such as McDonald's Omega is there. Test retest reliability is optional. It's done to assess stability over time. A confirmatory factor analysis must be conducted on a separate sample 
to verify and validate the proposed structure. Researchers should not simply rely on the outcomes of EFA. Every scale, whether newly developed or widely cited, should undergo CFA to confirm that its dimensional structure holds true across different samples. Neglecting this step risks building entire bodies of research on unstable measurement tools. Criterion validity assesses whether a scale's scores relate meaningfully to real-world outcomes. Predictive validity checks if the scale can forecast future outcomes, usually through bivariate or multivariate regression analysis. Concurrent validity examines how well the scale's scores align with a gold standard measured at the same time, typically using Pearson correlation. Stronger associations suggest good concurrent validity. Construct validity ensures the scale truly measures the intended concept. Convergent validity is assessed by correlating the scale with similar constructs using multi-trait, multi-method matrices, latent variables models or Pearson coefficients. Stronger correlations suggest convergence. Discriminant validity tests whether the scale shows low correlations with unrelated constructs, ensuring that it measures something distinct. Convergent validity is the extent to which a measurement tool correlates well with other measures that assess the same or similar constructs. If two different scales claim to measure the same concept, say anxiety, they should produce related results. High correlations suggest that the scale is capturing the intended concept. Convergent validity is assessed using average variance extracted where a value above 0.5 is acceptable. Discriminant validity ensures that a scale measures a distinct concept, showing low correlations with unrelated constructs. Within structural models, the formal locker criterion is applied. The square root of the AVE for each construct should exceed its correlations with other constructs. Newer approaches like the HTMT offer stricter tests. HTMT values below 0.85 or 0.9 serve as strong evidence for discriminant validity. Raw scores can initially be generated by either summing item scores directly from the scale or by calculating factor scores through statistical modeling. For narrowly focused studies, a simple unit weighted sum of items may be sufficient. For broader applications, researchers typically standardize the raw scores to enable meaningful comparisons. In scale development, norming refers to the process of creating a standardized reference for interpreting individual scores. This often involves transformations such as the Box-Cox procedure to adjust the distribution of scores towards normality. Once transformed, scores are standardized commonly into percentiles, Z scores or T scores using a normative sample that reflects the target population. Standardized scores allow researchers to interpret where an individual stands relative to others. So here's the summary of scale development. We began with defining the construct. We generated items, refined it, reduced it, and then pre-tested it. Then we go and sample and analyze, and then validate and standardize. And we remember that scale development is an iterative process.